and we're gonna go right ahead. David, uh, right. Dr. Ryan, take it off. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, welcome everyone to our wellness lecture. It's been a while since we've done this for cardiology, so I'm happy to be back doing this again. Uh, I chose this topic um, because we have seen cardiovascular complications of COVID in our practice, and I thought it would be a good time to bring out some of the science and data of why COVID affects your heart. Uh, I've tried to stick to the science. I know that COVID is a very polarizing topic for a lot of individuals, but hopefully we can uh, get through some of this, get an understanding of how COVID affects your heart and give everyone a, a better idea of potential complications. So to begin with, uh, COVID-19 is a contagious disease that we all know is called by, uh, caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. This is the second version of it. Uh, the first version was responsible for the outbreak in 2002 to 2024. Uh, it was first identified in Wuhan, China, isolated from an individual with pneumonia, and since then has spread quickly uh, to lead to our COVID-19 pandemic. To date, there are almost 800 million global cases with almost 7 million global deaths. The virus main uh, transmission route is by person-to-person -person respiratory transmission through droplets, sneezing, coughing, et cetera, within close proximity. Or although there is um, additional transmission modes such as contaminated surface and longer range transmission that occur in close spaces such as buses and so forth. The incubation period of the virus is usually about 14 days, although most cases will occur three to five days after exposure. The current variants that we deal with, Omicron, tend to have a much shorter uh, incubation period than former strains. So let's talk a little bit about the virus itself. Um, so this is sort of a, a picture of coronavirus, so COVID. And what I want you to know, the important piece of this is the spike protein. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about the spike protein and how it interacts with cardiac cells. Uh, the spike protein is also important because this is the major side of mutation between the different variants and how it continues to evade immunity. So if you guys can see my mouse here, this target right here is the spike protein or S protein. Uh, these viruses are RNA viruses, so sort of the instructions and the brain of the virus is located inside the cell here with this outer capsule that surrounds it and protects it. And this outer capsule is what's vulnerable to cleaning agents, air exposure that causes to break down of the virus over time. So today, there have been multiple variants of the COVID-19 uh, virus, and these are all due mostly to mutations in that spike protein. Uh, the alpha variant was also known as the UK variant. There was a beta variant, which came from South Africa, a gamma variant from Brazil, uh, the Delta variant came from India. I was fortunate enough to have the Delta variant myself. Uh, but most recently, we've been dealing with the Omicron variant, uh, which is the most infectious of the various variants that we've had to date. Omicron has now spread to over 57 countries, and we're now starting to see a new version of Omicron that you may hear about in the news called Arcturus. Um, this is a strain that is rapidly uh, rising in India, and it's a little different because not only does it cause the classical upper respiratory infection symptoms, but it also has a predilection to cause conjunctivitis in children, particularly under the age of 12. So here is a uh, graph that I took from the World Health Organization, which on the y-axis here shows number of daily cases, and on the x-axis here is demonstrating time. And what you can see is in India, we're almost now achieving a vertical transmission rate, a rapid rate of infection from this new Omicron variant. In fact, there's been a 13-fold increase in cases in the last month alone. So far, however, which has been pretty consistent with the other Omicron variants, these increase in infection in documented cases is not translated to increased deaths and hospitalizations. But what starts in India will eventually make it to the US. We've seen that multiple times before. And the cases in US have started to rise as well. Last week, this new Omicron variant accounted for 7.2% of all of our COVID cases, which has increased from 3.9% the week before and 2.1% the week before that. Most people who attain COVID uh, infection, particularly with Omicron variants, do not develop severe disease. Common manifestations could include fever, fatigue, nasal congestion, sore throat, dry cough, muscle pain, and in some cases, shortness of breath. 
In fact, when we look at the spectrum of the clinical disease, only about 81% develop mild to moderate symptoms. And we define mild to moderate as the things I mentioned before, the cough, the congestion, the fever, including all the way up to a mild pneumonia, which encompasses the vast majority of patients. About 14% will develop severe symptoms, such as worsening shortness of breath, hypoxia, which is the medical term for low oxygen levels in the blood, and also uh, more than 50% of the lung involvement on either chest X-ray or CAT scan. 5% will develop critical symptoms, and these are the ones that have the worst prognosis. The virus can lead to respiratory failure, it can lead to shock, and it can lead to a catastrophic condition called multi-system organ dysfunction. Most of the cardiac manifestations that I'm gonna to discuss today occur in people who have either severe or critical symptoms. So who's at risk for severe disease? Well, your age is probably the most important risk factor. This is a study which demonstrates here, age starting from 10 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, et cetera, and mortality rate. And as we see, the older you get with infection, the higher your mortality rate is. So if you're age 10 to 19, you have a 0.2% mortality rate, whereas if you're over 80, you have an approximate 14.8% mortality rate of infection. Now, what else defines people to have severe disease? Well, they've looked at risk factors for who's going to get hospitalized for COVID and who won't. And, who won't. and much of this is dependent on baseline comorbidities. So you can see here, if you have asthma, you're one and a half times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID than people who don't. If you have high blood pressure, three times, obesity, three times, diabetes, three times, chronic kidney disease is four times, severe obesity is four and a half times. If you have a combination of two of these risk factors, you're four and a half times more likely. Three or more risk factors, you're five times more likely to be hospitalized for COVID than someone who does not have these pre-existing cardiovascular conditions. So let's understand a little bit about how COVID affects your heart. Well, to do that, we need to know a little bit about how the blood pressure is regulated in the body, what the ACE2 receptor is and its role in cardiovascular complications of COVID, and how all this is important in terms of the spike protein. So your, your body has a very sophisticated way that it maintains blood pressure. And it is a pathway that involves multiple organs, including your lungs, your liver, and your kidney. Your liver produces a molecule which we call angiotensinogen. This molecule floats in your bloodstream. Your kidney senses blood flow through the arteries which lead to your kidney. So if the kidney senses low flow, it secretes a hormone called renin, which then takes this angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. This molecule is then converted to angiotensin 2 by a hormone or an enzyme called angiotensin -convert converting enzyme, which is in your lungs. The angiotensin 2 molecule is the one I want you guys to remember, because angiotensin 2 is what we'll be talking about in terms of the cardiotoxic effects of COVID. This angiotensin II molecule has a lot of effects in the cardiovascular system. It can constrict blood vessels to raise blood pressure. It can trigger your brain to make you thirsty so you drink water to expand blood volume. It stimulates your adrenal glands, which sit on top of your kidneys, to release hormones to retain salt and fluid, raising blood pressure and increasing volume in your bloodstream. Normally, there's a check and balance system for this angiotensin II. So here we have angiotensinogen, which is taken um, by renin, then the angiotensin, angiotensin 1 with the angiotensin converting enzyme is made to angiotensin 2. Many of you who have blood pressure issues take medications to inhibit this process. So if you take an ACE inhibitor with common names being lisinopril, enalapril, those medications inhibit this angiotensin converting enzyme, preventing the production of angiotensin 2. Other people may take angiotensin receptor blockers or ARBs. These are medications that bind to a receptor called an AT1 receptor on a cell membrane, and they prevent the action of angiotensin II. Well, if we know angiotensin II leads to 
blood pressure elevation, fluid retention, increased sodium, none of that's good for cardiovascular disease. So how do we monitor that within the body? It turns out that that happens by the ACE2. And this receptor in green here is the ACE2 receptor. And its job is to bind to the angiotensin II to remove it from the bloodstream. So it serves a cardioprotective effect. These ACE2 receptors are located all throughout the body. You can find them in your nose, the tongue, the mouth, the digestive tract, but most commonly they are located in the heart and lungs. So how does that have to do with the virus? So the SARS-CoV-2 virus has this spike protein, this S protein. This S protein then binds to the ACE2 receptor and the virus is then incorporated into the cell. So not only has the virus infected the cell and begins to replicate, it neutralizes the ACE2 receptor so it is no longer able to remove the angiotensin II molecule from the bloodstream. So what happens when the ACE2 is downregulated or not functioning as well? Well, like we said, you have elevated levels of angiotensin II in the bloodstream. So we have now unopposed constriction of blood vessels, causing elevated blood pressure. We start to retain more salt and fluid, increasing blood volume. We have increased inflammation. And we can get damage in the lungs to what are called alveoli or the air sacs. And that damage in the lungs can start to increase the permeability of the lungs to fluid, which can lead to a life-threatening condition called ARDS. So when we first identified this role of angiotensin II and this ACE2 inhibitor, there became a big concern about people taking these ACE inhibitor and ARB medications. And it was on the news and many people advocated for a while that we should stop these medicines. And the reason people became concerned is that if we start to block this angiotensin or angiotensin II molecule from the AT1 receptor, then we start to increase the plasma volume of angiotensin II. Well, in order to combat that, the body just makes more ACE2 receptors to remove it from the bloodstream. But if the virus starts to bind, bind to ACE2, and then we start to reduce ACE, uh, reduce ACE2 levels, then we're gonna have more angiotensin II in the bloodstream, which leads to theoretically, many of the adverse cardiovascular effects we just described. It turns out, however, that this was wrong. And after we stopped medications for people who may have congestive heart failure, or coronary artery disease, or hypertension out of fear that we would make the COVID infection worse, they actually had a poorer outcome because they started to have complications of their underlying cardiovascular disease. So at this point, if you are taking medications like a ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, there is no indication to stop them at this time. So that's a little bit about the physiology of how COVID interacts with your cardiovascular system the importance of the spike protein binding to the ACE2 receptor, reducing the ACE2 receptor availability, leading to increased angiotensin II concentration in the bloodstream, which then leads to high blood pressure, fluid retention, and increased inflammation. So how do we detect cardiac involvement with COVID? Well, for people that come into the hospital with COVID symptoms, the first thing we do are blood tests. And two of these blood tests we use are called biomarkers. And there are two biomarkers that are specific to the heart that are used. One is called a troponin, and the other is called a BNP, which stands for brain natriuretic peptide. A troponin is a regular regulatory protein that's in heart muscle cells that is involved in muscle contraction. And there are two specific cardiac troponins which are measured. One is a troponin I, the other is a troponin T. These are blood tests that we do, and they're commonly done every day in an emergency room. Most of the time, we use these to diagnose heart attacks. For instance, if you presented to the emergency room with chest pain, and we had concern that you may be having a heart attack, we would do this blood test to see if there was an elevated troponin value, which may help in your diagnosis. So here's an anatomical diagram of troponin. So a heart, has cardiomyocytes, which are sort of the basic muscular cells of your heart. 
And within those cardiac myocytes, you have various proteins. Myosin, actin are the big ones involved in contraction. But these troponins are sort of regulatory proteins which regulate the interaction between actin and myosin. So if we go down below, we have a heart attack. There is an occlusion in an artery feeding the heart muscle. The cardiomyocytes don't get oxygen and nutrients that they need and die. They release the troponin into the bloodstream, and then we can measure those troponin values, which can be suggestive of heart damage. Troponin elevation, however, is not entirely unique to heart attacks. There are many things that can elevate troponin in your bloodstream that doesn't necessarily have to do with a blocked artery or an occluded artery. For instance, if your heart's beating too fast or too slow, you can develop called demand ischemia, where there's a mismatch between the oxygen and nutrients the heart wants and what's able to be delivered. Critically ill patients in the ICU will have evidence of elevated troponin. Sometimes there are what we call non-thrombotic mechanisms, meaning not a blood clot in an artery, like a, a spasm of an artery or certain substance ingestion can lead to it. If you put strain on the heart with things like congestive heart failure or strain on the right side of the heart with blood clots going to the lungs, that can cause troponin elevation. Sometimes things that infiltrate the heart or inflammatory conditions like myocarditis, which we're going to discuss later, can lead to troponin elevation. So there are all different ways that troponin can be elevated in the blood, depending on the mechanism of what injures the heart. So how is troponin elevated in COVID? What is the mechanism of injury? Well, that's not really well defined at this point. Some people believe that the troponin elevation is due to direct viral invasion of the heart through incorporation with the ACE2 receptor. Other people believe that the troponin elevation is from heart failure. Perhaps someone has coronary artery disease or a bad heart valve, and the infection puts so much stress on their system that they develop heart failure as a complication. Or other individuals may have heart, uh, heart failure that they treat chronically, which is well compensated, but the virus causes them to decompensate by things like increased fluid retention. Some people believe that it's just due to increased inflammation, leading to conditions like myocarditis and another type of inflammatory heart condition called a stress cardiomyopathy. There's also what's described as a cytokine storm, which is sort of the end cascade of multi-system, multi-organ inflammation, which can be a, carry a very high mortality rate. Of course, People with COVID can have heart attacks, so you can have plaque rupture, including an artery, which we call a type 1 MI. There's also what's called a supply-demand mismatch, which we described earlier, where the heart wants more blood and oxygen, but it just can't get it. The heart, the cells that line the inner, um, inner part of blood vessels called endothelium can be affected in dysfunction. And there is also what are called thrombotic events, and I'll describe this in a little bit, most commonly a pulmonary embolus. Overall, 10 to 35% of patients that are hospitalized for COVID will manifest some degree of troponin elevation. So why do we care about troponin elevation so much? Well, one, it obviously indicates that the heart is damaged or irritable from the infection, but it also carries a significant prognostic sign. So the highest mortality we see in people who are infected with COVID are those who have pre-existing cardiovascular disease and an elevated troponin. On the flip side, the lowest mortality rate is in those without cardiovascular disease or an elevated troponin. In fact, the mortality rates for individuals with cardiovascular disease and elevated troponin can be anywhere from 48 to 51%, whereas those without increased troponin is substantially rest at 4.5%. It's also important to us the pattern of troponin rise. So if an individual is admitted with severe disease and they continue to have an elevated troponin on a day-to-day -day basis, a progressive rise in troponin, then that carries a very poor prognosis. Whereas opposed to an individual who may hey, have a mild elevation in troponin that remains stable or even downtrending, that remains a much more favorable prognosis for that individual. Some people feel that it may be useful to measure troponins, say, on an every other day basis when people are admitted to help guide us in this prognosis of the disease course. Let's turn our attention to the second biomarker. This is called BNP, 
Again, this is a very common blood test that is used in emergency rooms and in the hospital. If an individual presents feeling short of breath and we're unclear whether it could be a lung cause or a potential heart cause, a lot of times we will obtain this blood test. So if we have elevated levels of angiotensin II and we're leading to high pressure and fluid retention in the cardiovascular system, then that puts pressure and volume overload on the heart, which the heart doesn't want. And when it feels stretched because of the increased fluid, it releases this BNP molecule. This BNP then has multiple effects. One is it can act on the blood vessels to lead to vasodilatation or dilatation and lowering of pressure. Two, it alerts the kidney to remove the excess fluid from the body. And three, it sends signals to the brain to tell the brain to lower blood pressure, lower heart rate, and to do mechanisms that it can from central command to help restore the cardiovascular homeostasis. So here's a, what we call meta-analysis or a, a summary of studies which show BNP values and disease severity. So again, here on the y-axis, we have BNP levels, and here are two populations. The blue population represents those without severe disease. The red population represents those with severe disease. And as you can see, there is an all, over threefold difference between the levels of BNP in the bloodstream between those that end up having non-severe disease and those with severe disease. Therefore, having BNP be another predictive prognostic tool for disease severity. So let's get into a little bit of the clinical manifestations. The most common clinical manifestation is heart failure. And I'm gonna take a second just to kind of explain what heart failure is. So in the middle, this is a normal heart. Normal heart receives blood, has normal contractility, has normal function to allow output of the heart to meet the metabolic demands of the body. The first type of heart failure that we'll describe is systolic heart failure. So in this case, this main chamber, this left ventricle, which is, which is responsible for pumping the oxygenated blood to your body, becomes weak. And it can become weak by a number of mechanisms. Inflammation, such as myocarditis, a heart attack, a leaky heart valve. There are a number of things that can lead to it, but the overall mechanism is the heart doesn't contract well to pump blood out to the body. This is in contrast to what we call diastolic heart failure. In this case, the left ventricle isn't weak, it just builds up thick muscle, which doesn't allow it to relax. And by not relaxing, it doesn't fill with enough blood to maintain a adequate contraction. Things like untreated blood pressure over time can lead to thickening of the heart muscle leading to diastolic heart failure. So heart failure is the most common cardiac complication of hospitalized patients of COVID, manifesting in almost 33% of patients. What symptoms do you have with heart failure? Well, it could be shortness of breath, you can gain weight, you can develop leg swelling, as well as what's called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which is where you go to bed and you wake up several hours after falling asleep, feeling severely short of breath and classically have to go to a window to open it up to get fresh air. Well, how does heart failure happen in COVID? Well, many of these patients already have pre-existing cardiovascular disease and it's just the fluid retention, the increased blood pressure, the strain of the viral infection on the body in these severe and critical cases that just precipitate or decompensate the heart failure. Some of these patients, however, develop new heart failure, and it may be that the virus causes a heart attack or it causes an inflammatory weakness of the heart called myocarditis. Whichever the mechanism, development of heart failure during your COVID infection definitely carries an increased mortality risk. The next clinical condition is myocarditis, and this is the one that has probably gained the most attention in the news and media. Myocarditis is an inflammatory disease of your heart and your heart muscle. And the underlying mechanism is that it leads to dilatation, weakness of the heart, which causes the heart not to contract well. So you develop systolic dysfunction. Myocarditis is not unique to COVID. There are multiple ways that it can be caused, but viral infections are one of the leading etiologies. About three in every thousand people who are hospitalized due to COVID will develop myocarditis. 
And this myocarditis presentation can be an acute manifestation of the disease, but can also occur as a post-acute complication. Most people with myocarditis will develop chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, or even a sensation of an irregular heart rate. The possible causes for myocarditis have been postulated as direct viral damage, invasion of the cells, the inflammation, and as the, uh, well as the uh, overwhelming systemic inflammation that we described earlier, the cytokine storm. So here's a cartoon uh, diagram of myocarditis. So in the green down here, we have what is healthy myocardium. So the myocardium is the heart muscles, and this is the right ventricle here, the left ventricle, the walls of the left atrium, and the walls of the right atrium. In myocarditis, these muscles all become inflamed. And when they become inflamed, they become dysfunctional, they dilate, and the heart doesn't contract as well as it should. So how do we detect myocarditis? Well, much of it is done clinically. It may be based on symptoms of chest pain, chest pressure, shortness of breath. Some of it may be based on your EKG, elevations in troponin, elevations in BNP. But the gold standard test is an MRI of your heart. And this is a cardiac MRI, which is done with contrast. So again, here is your right atrium, your right ventricle, your left ventricle, and your left atrium. And what I want you to see is where these arrows are, this bright hyperintensity here is scarring and inflammation within the left ventricle from myocarditis induced by COVID-19. The second inflammatory condition that we're going to describe is called a stress cardiomyopathy. Now, again, this is not unique to COVID. This has been around for a long time. Some of you may know this as Takasubo cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome. Normally, when the heart contracts, you can see here that we have a symmetrical contraction of the left ventricle. In Takasubo cardiology, when the heart contracts, the basal portions of the heart contract fine, but the apical portions here all balloon and dilate out and become non-contractile. So another name for this condition is apical ballooning syndrome. It's given the name Takasubo cardiomyopathy because it was described by the Japanese. And the Japanese have a specific type of octopus trap that is a Takasubo, which is shaped like this. And the octopus crawls in to the pot, gets stuck, and then can't get out. So Takasubo cardiomyopathy, the pot, resembles how the left ventricle contracts when it's under stress. Most of these cases I have seen in clinical practice not necessarily all related to COVID-19 infection, all resolved with time with appropriate medication. So let's talk about heart attack, the next complication of COVID. The most common cause of a heart attack is plaque rupture within an artery. So on the top graph here, you can see that we have cholesterol plaque that is built up within the wall of an artery. These cholesterol plaques aren't stable and have a very thin fibrous cap on the top of them, which makes them prone to rupture. So if we start to cause higher levels of angiotensin II, which leads to increased inflammation, higher blood pressure, more volume in a bloodstream, then that can cause a lot of stress across the top of this plaque and lead it to rupture. When it ruptures, you have little blood cells in your body called platelets that then come stick to that cholesterol plaque and form a blood clot. And when you form a blood clot, the artery is sealed, it's obstructive, and you shut down blood supply to the heart muscle, which causes the heart attack. So that is the type 1 heart attack that can be induced by COVID. The second type is this demand mismatch. So maybe you have a 70% narrowing in a blood vessel that doesn't rupture, but it is restricting blood flow to the heart. So when you're sick and you have a fever and your oxygen levels are low, and your heart needs to squeeze harder, it's just unable to get the blood and nutrients to the heart muscle that it requires. Sometimes arteries can spasm, which can restrict blood flow. Sometimes the inner lining of the arteries can tear, which can restrict blood flow. And sometimes people are just so sick that the blood flow, oops, I go back. The blood flow to the heart, even though the artery is wide open, uh, just isn't sufficient. There's the heart is 
requiring to do so much work from the infection that even normal blood flow to the heart doesn't get it done. It causes heart damage with subsequent troponin elevation. The next cardiovascular manifestation is endothelial dysfunction. Well, what is your endothelium? Well, your endothelium is the blood cells that line all of your blood vessels. And in fact, it's the largest organ in your body. And there are over 3,000 to 6,000 square meters of endothelium within your body. And this endothelium is vitally important for vascular health. Uh, it acts as a barrier for blood cells so they don't leak out into the tissue. It's responsible for uh, immunity. It helps balance your blood clotting mechanism. It helps mediate inflammation within a blood vessel, and it helps to moderate blood, uh, blood pressure. So when the virus, when you're infected with COVID, this endothelium can dysfunction. And when it dysfunctions, you can have blood cells that leak out into the tissue, your increased uh, probability of blood clotting, both in arteries and veins. You start to secrete inflammatory markers into your bloodstream. So all of the important functions of the endothelium in maintaining good vascular health can be completely disrupted with your COVID infection. When we first started uh, seeing very critically ill patients with COVID, one of the biggest complications in terms of blood clotting was pulmonary embolus. And I don't see that as much more with the Omicron variants. Uh, I'm not in the ICU as much, but I do read the cardiac ultrasounds of individuals and it becomes very clear on ultrasound when people have acute pulmonary emboli. This happens because of the inflammation and sort of this pro what we call um, pro-inflammatory or hypercoagulable state of COVID, meaning that you're more prone to forming blood clots. So a blood clot can develop in your leg or somewhere in the lower extremity in these deep veins, and then it can break loose. And it can break loose and travel up your veins, up to the right side of your heart, where it gets pumped out to your lungs and lodges in an artery. And then it shuts down the blood flow to that portion of the lung, which can create an infarction, just like in the heart, can create an infarction in your lung. This can raise the pressures in your lung arteries dramatically. It can make it very difficult for you to oxygenate. Uh, sometimes these are even fatal. And it can also put a lot of stress on the right side of your heart because it's not meant to pump blood through high pressure circuits. COVID has also been responsible for heart rhythm disorders. The most common heart rhythm disorder is atrial fibrillation, which can occur in four to five percent of hospitalized patients. Normally, your heart runs on a very specific electrical system. The electrical impulses are start in the top right portion of your heart, in which we call your sinoatrial node, hence sinus rhythm. They then travel down to another piece of tissue called your AV node, which is between your atrium and your ventricles, the bottom chamber, and then down very specific electrical tracks into the ventricles. And it's this passage of electrical current through the heart muscle, which causes it to contract. And when everything's working properly, this contraction is a very rhythmic organized process that occurs on regular intervals. Hence, that's called sinus rhythm. In atrial fibrillation, we lose that organized mechanical activity in the atrium. So no longer do we have the origination of the impulse in the sinoatrial node traveling downward. We have tons of little electrical circuits in the top chambers, which cause a bunch of chaotic, irregular electrical activity. This irregular electrical activity is then spread down to the bottom chambers of the heart, which can make your heart beat in a very fast and irregular rhythm. This can cause symptoms of chest pain, chest pressure, shortness of breath, fatigue, lightheadedness, although some people can't feel this at all. They have no idea it's happening. One of the biggest complications of atrial fibrillation is not only the fast heart rate, it's not only the symptoms, is that this can lead to a stroke. While these top chambers aren't contracting rhythmically and are just fibrillating, they don't effectively pump out the blood. Blood can coagulate and form a blood clot which can then get pumped up to the brain and cause a stroke. Now, some indiv individuals are more apt to have stroke than others, but that is one of the biggest complications of undetected or ignored atrial fibrillation. We can also have heart rhythm disorders which come from the bottom chambers of the heart. The bottom chambers of the heart are called ventricles. 
Many of you may experience palpitations or feeling of a skipped heartbeat or a feeling that your heart pauses and then you have a very strong heartbeat that follows. Sometimes these are what are caused by premature ventricular contractions. Just an extra electrical impulse, which is generated from the bottom chamber of the heart, causing the heart to contract. Premature ventricular contractions can be totally normal. And in fact, when I read monitors, almost everyone has them to some degree. But when the heart is inflamed or the heart is irritated or the heart is damaged, PVCs may be a sign that the heart is in trouble. And the more PVCs you have, generally, the more trouble there is. PVCs, to a large degree and at a high volume, are seen in approximately 29% of people that are hospitalized for COVID infection. When we have a series of PVCs in a row, that's even more dangerous, and we call that non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, which occurs in about 15% of people hospitalized for COVID. The dreaded ventricular arrhythmia, which is ventricular fibrillation, otherwise known as cardiac arrest, originates in about 1.4% of people hospitalized for COVID. So what is long COVID? These are all the acute cardiovascular manifestations we've discussed. We've talked about myocarditis, stress cardiomyopathy. We've talked about heart attacks that could be induced, endothelial dysfunction. What is long COVID? Well, long COVID is really symptoms that persist for three months, from, uh, three months or longer from symptom onset. And many people have described fatigue, chest pain, a persistent cough, shortness of breath. Some people have described headache, joint pain, muscle pain, diarrhea, an alt a prolonged altered taste sensation. Some people have neurocognitive defects, sort of this ongoing feeling of brain fog, insomnia, anxiety, depression. And everyone wants to ask me, well, how long does this last? And I think the short answer, unfortunately, is no one really knows. Some people think that the duration of your long COVID symptoms can be really dependent on how bad your risk factors for COVID infection were going into the illness, how severe your illness was, and how bad your initial symptoms were. One of the other long-term complications that I've personally seen and wanted to put in this lecture is what's called dysautonomia. So you have two parts of your nervous system. You have a central nervous system, which is your brain, which acts as the command center for the body. And then you have a peripheral nervous system. And your peripheral nervous system sort of acts as the conduit between the central nervous system and the rest of your body. Within your peripheral nervous system, you have a autonomic branch. And your autonomic branch has two aspects. One's called your sympathetic. Your sympathetic nervous system, it's what's triggered when you get scared or frightened, when your heart races and you feel like you can run. It's the fight or flight. That's activation of your sympathetic nervous system. This is balanced by your parasympathetic nervous system. Your parasympathetic nervous system is what's activated when you're calm and relaxed. And the two are always kind of working together to keep the body in a steady state. What happens in dysautonomia is you have failure of this autonomic nervous system. And that can either be due to overactivation of the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system or failure of either one of them. Common things that I have seen is one, orthostatic hypotension. Normally, when you stand up, your blood vessels constrict, your heart rate increases to maintain blood flow to the brain. To the brain. But this can become dysfunctional with dysautonomia, and your blood pressure can drop inappropriately when you stand, making you feel lightheaded, and in some cases, even causing you to pass out. Another condition, and I have several patients in the practice with this, is called POTS syndrome. POTS syndrome is a little different than orthostatic hypotension. People still feel really poorly when they stand up and they can have a headache, palpitations, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, chest pain when they stand. But it's not necessarily due to a drop in a blood pressure. It's more due to an inappropriate increase in their heart rate with standing. So what are the long-term cardiovascular risks of COVID-19 to you? Well, there's really been few studies which have addressed this tried to find as much scientific literature as I could for you because there's so much hearsay on the internet, it makes it difficult to give accurate facts. The only study that I could really find that addressed this was a study that was done in the VA. So there were over 150,000 individuals that were followed after they had survived 30 days of COVID infection 
um, comparing that to over 5 million individuals who had never received a COVID infection, and they monitored them after that 30-day time frame for up to one year. And they looked at what were the increased risk over that time, time frame of stroke, heart rhythm disorders, inflammatory heart disease, such as myocarditis, ischemic heart disease or, or a heart attack, and thrombotic disease like pulmonary embolus. And here's what they found. This graph here demonstrates what we call hazard ratios, as in how much more likely are you to have a disease process than someone who didn't have the disease process. This line would represent neutral. So if you were on this side, you'd be less likely to have these complications than someone with COVID. And if you're on this side, you are more likely to have the complication than someone who didn't have COVID. This side less likely, this side more likely. And you can see with every single one of these conditions, whether we're talking about cerebrovascular disorders, heart rhythm disorders, inflammatory heart disease like myocarditis, coronary artery disease, thrombotic disorders, what we call MACE, which is major adverse cardiovascular outcomes, every single one of these conditions, there was an increased risk of development as opposed to someone who did not have COVID previously. Now, I think you have to be a little careful interpreting this data because many of these individuals in the VA had baseline significant pre or comorbid comorbidities. But I think it's an important signal to understand that having a COVID-19 infection, particularly a severe or critical infection, can increase your risk of cardiovascular disease as we see it at least up to one year. I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about vaccines. I was, didn't really wanna get into this too much because it's such a polarizing and debatable topic, uh, but I wanna explain a little bit how these mRNA vaccines work. The vaccine, mRNA, this mRNA is like a instructional molecule that's made into a lab. It's designed to go into a cell and tell it to do something. And then they pack this molecule into these particles. These particles are then put into the vial and then you receive your vaccination. Usually this is done in the region of muscle cells. So these little particles are absorbed by the muscle cell. This instructional molecule, this mRNA, is then released into the bloodstream. And once it's in the cell, or I'm sorry, it's released into the cell. And once it's in the cell, it tells the cell to make spike proteins. These spike proteins are then released into the bloodstream. Your body recognizes that as a foreign, a, a foreign substance. It makes antibodies to it, and now your body has antibodies prepared for COVID exposure or COVID infection. This is why there are so many boosters as we continue to have mutations in these spike proteins, making some of the previous vaccinations not effective or have reduced ability. So what about the complications of vaccines? And there are all kinds of complications that are described from localized reactions to allergic reactions, but I thought it would be important to touch on the role of myocarditis and pericarditis in the setting of vaccination. Well, as we know, myocarditis is inflammation of the heart muscle. Pericarditis is inflammation of the covering of the heart or the outer lining of the heart. These have similar symptoms of chest pain, shortness of breath, and fever. These usually occur within a week of vaccination and are most prevalent after people receive the second dose. It's unclear why, it caught, why these conditions could be caused by vaccination, and it's estimated to occur in about 36 out of 100,000 people. The vast majority of these are male and under the age of 21. Most of these patients required short hospital stay with a medium of 4.1 days. They all had elevated cardiac biomarkers that we described, as well as abnormal cardiac MRIs. Most of these cases of vaccine-induced myocarditis resolved with conservative therapy. So here's a graph from the CDC, and what we have here on the x-axis is time from vaccination to symptom onset, and we have number of cases. And what I want you to see here is that the majority of the myocardial cases or the symptoms of the myocarditis occurred all within five days of vaccination. The blue line represents the first dose. The red line represents the second dose, highlighting that the majority of these occur after the second vaccination dose. Here's another graph from the CDC, which shows age and preliminary reports of myocarditis. Again, we can see that the majority of these 
occur in younger individuals under the age of, let's see, 26. Uh, the blue line represents the first dose, the red line represents the second dose. Underlying theme being that the majority of the vaccine-induced myocarditis cases have occurred in younger individuals receiving the second dose of the vaccine. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with the fact that COVID-19 can have significant cardiovascular complication. But most of these complications occur in people who have pretty high baseline risk. The risk is highest in older individuals with pre-existing cardiovascular conditions. I think it's important for everyone to understand that if you do develop COVID-19 infection, most of you will have mild to moderate symptoms and will not suffer significant cardiovascular complications. But if you develop chest pain, chest pressure, shortness of breath, feelings of an irregular heart rate, swelling in your legs, or cramping or discomfort in your legs, particularly if it's asymmetric, that may be a sign of a serious clinical condition and I would seek help at that time. There is also a possibility that even after you recover from COVID, particularly if you have a severe infection, that you may be at increased risk of cardiovascular conditions over the next year, but I think more data is needed to highlight that point. I'd like to thank all of you for listening and I would like to open up to your questions and I'll do my best to answer them at this time. Great. Thank you, Dr. Young. We did receive some questions already. And if you have one, um, you can ask in the Q and a box at the bottom of your screen or in the chat box, whichever is easiest. Uh, the first question is, can you address intermittent, uh, tachycardia? Is that how you say that? Yeah. Okay. Well, so tachycardia is just an elevated heart rate. That's what the name is. So an intermittent tachycardia which is, I assume they're referring to just periodic fluctuations in their heart rate. And I guess I would wanna know, is, is that in response to COVID or is that in response to just generalized symptoms? Um, if it's in response to COVID, you know, that's in, that could very well be to some degree of dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system from the infection. If it's not due to COVID, there are a multitude of other things that can cause periodic elevations in your heart rate. And that's, probably a br bit broader than I can get into right now. She did clarify that it was um, tachycardia post-COVID recovery. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that. And I think that's an autonomic dysfunction. I've seen people with persistently elevated heart rates. I've seen people who have developed high blood pressure that has persisted after COVID. I would encourage that you see a cardiologist follow your heart rate. You may be interested in having an echocardiogram just to make sure that everything's structurally okay with the heart following the infection. And it may be worthwhile to wear a heart monitor too to track the variations of your heart rate. Great. Um, there are a couple questions about the vaccine. So I'll ask, I'll just ask them each. Um, I'll ask one and then you can answer. But the first one is, do the spike proteins produce, produced by the MR, M, sorry, mRNA in the COVID vaccinations have the same impact on, I'm not sure if it's ACE2 or ACE2 receptor? Oh, the ACE2. You know, that's a very good question. Yeah. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, that's, that's a very intuitive question. Uh, I don't think so. Um, but I think that that's certainly something I will have to look into and get back to you. That's, that's a very good question. Yeah, and it was an anonymous question, but um, you're welcome to email me from the from the webinar um, email, and I'm happy to pass that along. Um, the second question is: Can someone can some of these same heart issues be due to the vaccine itself? Um, they know personally of three previously healthy people who never had uh, the actual COVID virus but got the vaccine and now suffer from AFib. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a hard subject to get into. Um, and I think that there are medical literature that we rely on. And I think there is clinical experience that we rely on too. Um, and it's really hard for me, uh, the vaccination issue, because uh, sometimes you get torn between as a medical professional, what you need to say, and maybe what your personal beliefs are. Uh, and I would just say that it's very well possible. Okay, I think that these mRNA vaccines and um, are new, newer, uh, and that more time is just going to have to tell as to what potential complications they could be from vaccine. I've seen who have or other cardiovascular conditions when the only 
potential causative factor was a vaccination history. Okay. Um, there is a question about how to improve heart health after COVID. Well, I think that, you know, there's, there's two things. Number one, um, depending on the severity of your illness and whether or not you developed any of the cardiovascular complications of COVID, that may dictate a little bit of time in what you need to do in terms of exercise and so forth. So for instance, if someone develops myocarditis from COVID, we're very cautious with what they do for a period of time after they recover. For most of you who develop a mild to moderate COVID infection illness that recovers within two weeks, as long as you're asymptomatic without chest pain, chest pressure, shortness of breath, you should be fine to go back to your regular activity. And, and in fact, that's probably the best thing you can do to minimize cardiovascular complications from COVID is to exercise, to get good sleep, to monitor alcohol intake, to have a good diet, uh, to attain an ideal body weight, make sure your blood pressure is controlled. Uh, those preventative mechanisms are probably the most important thing. Okay. The next question is, if atrial fibrillation was diagnosed post-COVID, is it possible for it to go away uh, with time? Yeah, of course, and especially if it's the first onset of atrial fibrillation. So, you know, atrial fibrillation is extremely common, and I, I may see five patients a day who have atrial fibrillation, so it's not entirely unique to COVID. Uh, in the management of atrial fibrillation, particularly if it's the first time you've had it, yes, there's a high probability that you can be put back into your normal rhythm. Now, some of that depends on your age and other existing cardiovascular conditions, but absolutely, if this is your first onset of, of atrial fibrillation and you've otherwise been healthy, then I would say there's a very good chance that you could be put back in your normal heart rhythm. Wonderful. Well, I don't see any other questions that have come through. Um, it looks like I might get that email address for that specific question, but if you have anything, you can ask it in the next minute as I wrap things up. Um, I'll just remind everyone here that um, this presentation has been recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel. And um, we are also sending out a survey post the wrap up of this webinar. We'd love to hear your feedback, how we did and what topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. And I just am seeing a lot of um, thanks so much for the great presentation and the great details. So I think we are at time. And Dr. Young, thank you so much for being here tonight and for taking the time to really get into detail on this topic. Um, we appreciate it and we hope everyone has a good rest of their evening. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you for everyone for attending.